My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. Thanks for tuning in to Transmissions. It's good to have you here. Today on the program, Tom Sharpling of The Best Show and Double Threat. He's written a deeply funny and moving new book called It Never Ends, and it's out now wherever you get books. It documents his early days writing and producing a DIY fanzine, working his way into TV writing with the popular show Monk, and his establishing a lifelong friendship and comedy partnership with drummer John Worcester. It also provides a really candid look at his struggles with mental health, and uh, there are some, some moments that are pretty harrowing, but it's ultimately a really inspirational read, an underdog story from a guy who's especially good at giving voices to underdogs. And again, it is, it is very funny. I'm a huge fan of Tom as a broadcaster and as a writer and as a human, so it was great to discuss the book with him, as well as get into uh, his incredible sound collages and uh, some deep Lou Reed riffing. Uh, we talk about CSNY and DIY Drive and uh, a lot more. So without too much more delay, why don't we get into this week's episode of Transmissions? But first, a word from our sponsor. Have you heard Black Puma's self-titled debut album? It was nominated for four Grammys, including Album of the Year and Record of the Year. Oh, and they're incredible live. The band is touring across the US and EU with multiple dates in Seattle, San Francisco, and Chicago, along with festivals like Lollapalooza, Austin City Limits, Ohana, and Summerfest. Most of these shows are already sold out, but don't miss a chance to catch them live if they come to your town and snag a copy of their album wherever you purchase or stream music. Okay, thanks for tuning in. Here's my conversation with Tom. It Never Ends is available wherever you get books now. I'll speak with you a little bit more on the other side. Here's me and Tom. Tom, it's really great to have you here on Transmissions. Congrats on this great new book, and thanks for taking the time to hang out with us. Awesome. No, thank you. I'm a huge fan, as you know, and I'm excited to just be a part of the the huge body of work that is Aquarium Drunkard. Oh, that's that's really uh, incredibly nice of you to say. I am a huge fan of of. Not just the best show, but you as a broadcaster specifically. Um, I've been thinking about the way you have such an interesting relationship with like rhythm on air, uh, sort of silences and a little bit of a, a, an, a, like you'll leave the audience hanging in a way that is so interesting to me. And it's definitely what drew me into the show. You'll leave the audience hanging and then sort of reward them for the attention and uh, anyway, I'm just a huge fan of, of your, your on-mic vibe. Well, that is truly, no, no, no joke, that is a very kind thing to say, because that's something that um, I kind of feel I'm very happy that I was able to develop whatever rhythm it is and kind of own it and be able to embrace it, because it's not the easiest path to... Uh, Take advantage of silence is a scary thing until you get a handle on it. Then it kind of becomes your friend and then it can almost even become like you can weaponize it in a way. It's very strange because if people aren't used to it, it's terrifying to say something and not that I, I don't weaponize it, but you can see how somebody could use it for ill uh, to like if I, if I was interviewing somebody, you could let somebody just marinate in the silence and it's scary. You just, it, it got to a point where I just built it up to trust that somebody must be laughing at this and I can uh, hear their, their la imaginary laughter somewhere. And right. that kind of 
helps helps sustain the uh, something that you don't get immediate feedback on, which is such a strange thing because you get zero feedback. It's just like it's straight up silence. You could say the funniest thing you ever said in your life, and you're saying it to deafening silence. Right, right. Yeah, it, you're, I mean, you're right that you can weaponize it. Like I remember the fir- when I was first started doing interviews with people, uh, some I, I don't remember who told me, but somebody told me like maybe it was maybe I had even done an interview live, and somebody said like you don't you're uh, you're you're making your guest too comfortable by like kind of prompting them along. You need to let things sit, you know, sometimes. And for me, like realizing like just shy of the weaponizing it you know sort of thing is like where you 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 have to give people room in a in a way in in a way that makes it feel conversational and makes them feel like they have the space to say what they want but yeah there's that thing where there's a real tendency a human tendency to just want to fill up all the space you know absolutely no that's a real like you said it's a human default setting where you're just like there's silence I got to put something there. And especially when you deal with performer types who certainly like to talk. So they (laughs) would have no problem filling in any empty space. Uh, But it can be challenging if you're dealing with maybe not the chattiest person ever. And, but I think I at least am somewhat accustomed to the silence that it doesn't throw me as much as, as it might for somebody else, but it still gets to me. Like when, like if Jay Maskus, for example, would kind of <laughs> let's lets things uh, just as kind of tight with the with the answers to questions. It's like that would that would rattle anybody, but it doesn't really <laughs> doesn't it doesn't matter that it doesn't do that much. So yeah, we I mean yeah we had Jay on a uh, a. Uh, oh an episode and it yeah i've gotten the most uh the most emails about that episode uh from people telling me uh the similar similar i had a similar experience to you tom is what i'm mm-hmm. is what i'm getting at. I, i'm dancing sure. around it not <clears throat> the no. ch- not the chat <laughs> but there's something beautiful about this guy who is not chatty says what he says through his music and that's where he does all his talking there's something i really do like about that so i get it yeah yeah no totally but on that thing that we're talking about with rhythm you know and the the way you do stuff i I wanted to actually ask you to start off a little bit about about the sound collages which I, i don't think there has been uh recently on the best show i don't i don't i think it's been a minute since we've heard a sound collage but I just wanted to, since we have the opportunity and we're chatting, tell you how specifically the sound collages at the start of the pandemic were, um, for me, they were just so powerful. There was a weird zone that you seemed tapped into. And I specifically remember that that Neil Young choir recording thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't know, those 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 sound collages felt apocalyptic in like a in a in a sort of a sort of a good way or maybe i don't know maybe not a good way just they did they 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 tapped into that that spirit a little bit oh thanks i just i the the, they will be coming back right now i'm dealing with some uh tech stuff and that is kind of hanging us up right now that i'm kind of between two two chapters of the show right now a little bit and i need yeah i need a uh more more uh permanent uh home base and that's being figured out so yeah sound yeah. collages are right around the corner all that stuff is right around the corner this is kind of a, a an interesting period where i've stripped so much away from the show due to uh technical limitations and but everything's going to be back and i have new ideas for things also so it's i'm very excited about just turning the corner and it's one of those things where um i just gotta see you know there's only so many hours in the day and it's like i gotta oh yeah do the book stuff the right way but the the 
number one priority, always the show. And that's coming. Uh, so yeah. And those, those collages right b- during the pandemic and the George Floyd, uh, protests and, and it was just like, they do feel slightly, uh, there's a sense of doom, uh, and dread because there was so much of it. And I was trying to tap into that and it's, it's kind of my, my favorite part of the sound collages is kind of pulling an element from something and isolating it. And then it has a whole other feel to it. And it's just like yeah. the idea of taking kids singing after the gold rush, which is on in one context, a very nice thing. But in another way, it's these disembodied kids voices that are terrifying. And then it's a whole yeah. other thing. Then you <laughs> get the creeps from it. Um, yeah. Those are my favorite things is to like pull an element to loop something that sounds one way in a record when you only hear it once. And then you make it sound horrifying. Like um, I was thinking just like the strings in the break on evil woman when it's like, it's like, it's like it's like right before the yeah. chorus kicks back in for the end it's just like in terms of a pop song that's such an amazing moment just this weird kind of <laughs> stunning uh out of nowhere moment but then when you isolate it it's just like oh that's horrifying and when you loop yeah. it it becomes that much more horrifying it just becomes it sounds so menacing those are my favorite things about the collages like one of the loops that nobody ever gets guesses is um, um, from uh, Kick Out the Jams. It's from Borderline when um, at MC5, when Rob uh, Tyner's, it's kind of like right before it kicks in, it's like, it's kind of like this. He's doing this kind of howl. And it just sounds terrifying when you pull just the howl and loop it. It sounds just like it's really unsettling, but it just comes from an MC five song that was yeah. just, it sounded, it sounds so rocking when in the entirety of, in the body of the song pulled, pulled out of its, its moorings. It sounds just so, uh, so kind of makes, makes me slightly queasy even. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that re recontextualization that way and the sort of juxtaposition of it. That's why the, I mean, that's why the collages are, they were, when I first started getting into the show, that was the stuff that that took acclimating to, you know what I mean? I was just like, what is going on now? You know, but, mm-hmm. uh, but as it goes on, yeah, you definitely hear, and I don't know, like it's, it's weird to, to try to like tie it, you know, creative approach wise to this book, it never ends, which is, which is great, you know, but I, I I guess I wonder if there does, if it feels to you like there maybe is a little bit of a connection in terms of that, because part of what you do over and over again over the course of this book is, is tell these very intense and emotionally uh, fraught stories, you know, Mm -hmm. but obviously it's a really funny book as well. Uh, and, and the humor comes usually right in the midst of some of the, the most intense stuff, you know? So I guess I, 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 I guess it's like a goofy thing to ask a comedy writer, like is comedy just juxtaposition? But I mean, it sort of is right. Oh yeah. Now that it's, it's, it's like, it well it depends on what your, your goal is, I guess, it, depending on how much what what kind of comedy you're you're trading in at the moment if you're doing stuff that's just like so dark that it's like gallows humor that's one thing and right um but i i kind of tried to to um my goal with the book was i wanted it to be funny from that that was it number one number one goal is i wanted to be funny but side by side with that the other number one goal was this is stupid thing to say (laughs) two number one goals um one and one a now i realize why people do one and one a i just yeah (laughs) lived it and now um now it's a thing where it's like i want it to be funny and i didn't want it to be any sort of 
pity party, mm-hmm. wah, like boohoo kind of thing. But I also didn't want it to um, kind of, I didn't want to minimize anything or shortchange anything that actually happened in my life for the, for the sake of laughs. And I didn't want to come away from this feeling like, man, all I did was take things that happened to me and turn them into comedy. So the things that, that were painful for me are nothing but uh, laughs for other people or just entertainment for other people. Um, but I wanted it to be some of that. I didn't want it to be unentertaining. I wanted it to, I wanted to try to find a way to make anything that, any story I'm telling, I tried to um, find ways to to make it make it funny one way or another, even if it was uh, in the bleakness of of things. To just kind of embrace that side of it, I really because I've read I've read comedy memoirs, and some people have told very serious ones where I'm like, this book is great, but it's not a comedy book. It's just right. It's just somebody telling about the the things that happened to them in their life or the trials and tribulations in their life, and they chose to just tell it straight and not make it funny. I was like, well, I don't want to do that, but I also didn't want it to be kind of flip and be like, yeah, you know, whatever things happen. What are you going to do? It's like, no, it's it's real stuff, right? And I wanted to, I wanted to honor myself. If I could say that, just talk about saying corny things. It's like, um, I did want to kind of honor and respect myself through the process, but also find ways to be funny through the process too. So it was a real tricky, tricky balance. You've mentioned that it, it, it was a, a difficult book to write and obviously you know some of the some of the subject matter you're talking about uncomfortable or heavy things you know but but as far as the actual writing goes uh was that part hard or did you enjoy that sometimes maybe sometimes not as much i mean as far as the actual writing part goes you know was that pretty exciting to get into that zone yeah it was it was exciting to it was exciting to watch the um, like the word count climb when I was saying like, all right, this chapter is you know eight thousand words. This one's forty five hundred words. This is six, and just like adding them up and being like, with some goal of kind of being around eighty to ninety thousand words, I was like. Um, man, I'm getting closer. Like I could feel the book take shape and I could see the stuff start to add up and be more real with each, each day. Even it was like, we're getting closer and to see, to see that get built was really exciting. And I was really, um, thrilled by that part of it. The actual, the emotional part of the writing was, was hard and maybe less, uh, thrilling but but there were certain days where i would be like i'd write and i would just be exhausted at the end of the day i would just want to take a nap or put an ice pack on my head because it was i hadn't really written like that before like just to just to be just about myself yeah never yeah never written like that so it took a different kind of um energy it was a definite definitely draining in a different way a way i wasn't ready for and um those days were kind of a challenge uh but i would get up and do it the next day because i had a deadline to hit and i needed to finish this thing and it but it was a, it was a, it was a huge journey and there were parts that were just just exhilarating and thrilling to write certain things and to make connections between things in my life that I never realized until I was like literally in the writing process I'm like oh wow look at that look at the through line here on certain things and then I would go back to the beginning to address 
to set up the right. through line that revealed itself later, much later than I ever thought it would. So like to not to get too inside baseball, but it really was a constant discovery and realization throughout. And yeah, it was really, uh, it was, it was thrilling and exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. You talk at, about how you kind of didn't wait for anybody to give you permission to start making things as a young person. You started your own fanzine and you kind of had this almost DIY drive to do stuff. Uh, did you find even back then that a thing like a deadline was very helpful for you in terms of just getting anything done, knowing when you have to like let go of something, for example? Um, yeah, all of that stuff was just foundational in terms of you realize about responsibility and, and that the buck stops with you on this and it's not going to, Right. It's not going to get done. And it's also the kind of thing. It's like, nobody cares. Nobody <laughs> cares if I quit. If suddenly I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. It's like for like, I really do believe like the, the day I say like, I'm done. Thanks everybody. I'm out. There'd be like about two weeks tops where people would be like, Oh no, I'm sad. <laughs> and then people find new things to pay attention to. That's how entertainment works. That's how content works. It's like there's just so much of it. Something fills the void immediately. And that's not a bad thing. It, it, it look at look at how quickly people forget who like John Stewart was. Like right. he was <laughs> forgotten. People were like he was everybody's hero. And then when he left, everybody went somewhere else. It's just what people do and it's what they're supposed to do. You're not supposed to sit right. in mourning, hoping that someday John Stewart will come back or David Letterman will come back or any of these people. It's like, if they go, that's their prerogative. We'll find something else to keep us entertained. And, um, Yeah. I don't know. What is that? Where'd we go with the question? Am I in? I don't even know any. What, what was I, the question? I think, the, I think the question was simply, you know, sort of putting like putting deadlines in place. Oh yeah. So that you can, so that you can say at the very least, like, okay, I'm going to work on it up until this point. And I, I know, I know that at any time, anytime I don't set that for myself, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm screwed. You know what I mean? It's a, yeah. it's a really, it's a really upsetting situation sometimes. Yeah. Well, what I meant to, what, to tie back to tie all this back to your, your question was that it's on the individual to take care of the individual's business with stuff like that. The world, you're not doing it for the world. Ultimately you're doing it for yourself. So you have to make sure you're doing something sure. you want to do. And right. you're responsible for getting it out because the world will move on whether you get it done or not. That's what I was trying to get to. Um, yeah. But honestly, working retail and running a music store um, taught me as much as I ever needed to know about commitment and responsibility and deadlines and delivering on yeah. promises just working retail taught me all that stuff and coming from a family that was, uh, that it was and still is a family that works retail and is self-employed small businesses. Like, so stuff that kind of spooked other people, I was just like, no, okay. If I want to put a fanzine out, it's like, how much is this going to cost? Let me get, now let me work extra hours at the music store, start socking money away so I can pay to print the fanzine. And then when I sell X amount of them, then that means I get to put a second issue out and maybe have a little bit of money that can go towards something else or to go towards right. making the second issue a little bit bigger than the first issue was like those things didn't phase me at all. That's just doing business. And it was always amazing 
to me when I would meet people who always worked with other people's money and the last thing they would ever consider would be to, to use their own money for anything. And I'm sure this is a, it's a foolhardy thing on my part because kind of the goal is to work with other people's money so you don't lose your shirt. But I would always <laughs> put my own money into things and I would always, and I still do, I would always back, put my money where my mouth is. It's like I would, I wanted to put records out, 18 wheeler, we put singles out. So I started, I was like, how much is it going to cost to do a single? It was like $1,200. I remember it was like kind of like to all, all in for shipping and all that. We're looking at, I, I'm going to need about 1200 bucks. So I was just like, let me work on getting my hands on $1,200. And yeah. I had it. And then I could put a record out. Then I'm just like, okay, well, if we sell the record, then I can probably put out, if it does well, I can put two singles out and on the next go. And that's kind of how that worked. And I just, I've always done it that way. I, when I started directing videos, I put my own money into some of these videos. I mean, I put thousands of dollars into videos that were done by like real labels because I just yeah. need, I needed the thing to look a certain way and to, to be a certain way. And that was worth it to me. And right. other, other people might think that's the dumbest thing they ever heard. And maybe it is, but it, it made sense to me to do that. Um, so I did it. Yeah. You, you also talk though about how, when you did start working with magazines and publications and, and things like that, I, I felt I felt I there were a lot of times where I really related to parts of this book, you know, which is obviously the thing that like something so cool about a memoir like that is, is when you get to walk around in somebody's head and, and you realize that they're a person and, and that you're a person and that there's all these things you share with the person, which of course, you know, you know, but then it's still a, a, a really exciting thing. But I, you described sort of this willingness to be like. I don't remember the exact, I can't quote the exact part, but you were basically saying something along the lines of like, okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll do this for this amount of money. And sure, then like, yeah. okay, no, I'll do, I'll do it for less actually. And then by the end of the, the hilarious segment you've got going, like you're now paying them to like, uh, publish you or, or whatever. And I, I just remember that feeling so clearly, you know, this sense of just like, I will do it. Yeah. There was a there were a couple of years where the the alt weekly here in Arizona Phoenix started letting me write stuff, you know. That's the way I viewed it at least. They were letting me do it. It wasn't that mm -hmm. I was providing them any sort of service. It sure, was Sure, no. Literally, why would you why would you think that way? That would Yeah, you, you know. They were bringing anything to the table. <laughs> they were they were providing uh a courtesy to you. Yeah, to, exactly. To, to write for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, but I, I remembered that so, so clearly, you know, and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have a degree in writing and I didn't have anything else. So I was able to, in my brain at least, to like build a very solid case for the, the, exactly what we're describing, which was that I, I just lucked into this thing. And I remember my big plan, my big goal mm -hmm. was I'll just say yes to everything they ask me to do. You know, yeah. and I kept that up for a couple years. And the funniest thing is I now look back on it and I think, yeah, that's probably not. You probably didn't have to do it exactly like that. But there's this other part of me that's like kind of glad I did in a weird way, you know, because I've never ended up hanging out with Papa Roach, but I've had things that are, <laughs> you know, similar, you know. No, so I'm curious. Still, I'm curious still... about that. It's still time. There is still time. Yeah, it yes. could it could happen. It could happen. Um, but yeah, th I just I that that thing you're saying that sort of like I don't know if it's like just work ethic. I guess that's a big part of it, you know. Um, but yeah, at the I same think, time, I, yeah, I think it's I think it's work ethic. I think it's also you're excited for me at least. I was excited to get to do these things, and I wanted every opportunity to get better at them. It really yeah. was like the, whatever, that Malcolm Gladwell thing, like the 10,000 hours or whatever that is. It's just like, even though that wasn't a thing when I was starting out, that 
book hadn't been written yet, but there was something just in my bones that just knew it's just like, I want to be good at this and I want to, yeah. that means I got to take as many swings as I can get, get. And that means I just got to, like you said, I got to say yes to everything. That's the only way I'm going to get good at it. That's like when I hear standups talk about going up over and over and just like, yeah, every night. And you're like, man, you're really, this is, you're really committed to this. And it's like, of course you are. You want to be great at it. And there's no, there's no kind of, there's no shortcut for that stuff or there's no, there just isn't. And some, some people will be just like, so how do you get started in writing? It's like, for my thing was so weird and, and circuitous and unlikely and everybody's is. But the one thing that I can say is just like, you kind of just have to start writing and just keep writing. And you kind of don't get to say when you stop. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not, yeah. it's out of your hands. The thing that is in your hands is how much writing you do. And that's in your control. So control that part and do what you can. So you're ready to, for just about anything. And you can, um, you won't just get caught uh, with your pants down if suddenly somebody knocks on your door and you're like, oh, no, I don't know what, I, here's my opportunity. I don't know what to do with it. So Right, right. Do you think, do you think that you could have written this book when, when you were younger or is this, is this the situation where it was the right time and you need it and you needed to... to to work oh, it, your way to it. It's exactly that. It's the the latter there. It's just like I couldn't have written this book like a minute before I wrote this book. Yeah. It took yeah. this long for me to be able to own what my life was and is and yeah. and to be able to have perspective on things and it was still as early as could be just like I still was figuring things out in my life as it was happening. And it was, there was a chat that was a challenge just right. And, um, but I just had to draw a line and be like, okay, the book stops here. And then I can safely tell any of those stories from this point earlier. Um, yeah, it really was, uh, I could not have done, this any earlier than I did. And I, I always joked about the idea of like, why, where, when do I get a book? Why does this person have a book? And I don't, it's like, and it's like, <laughs> that was completely within my power. And I knew the truth. If I was being completely honest with myself, that it just wasn't, I wasn't looking to do it. Cause I knew if I was going to do it, I wanted to kind of wanted to do this type of book as my first book yeah. maybe my only book i don't know but it's like if i'm only gonna get one shot at this i needed it to be this book and it was the best way for me to a book was really the only way for me to discuss some of the things that happened in my life the way i needed to tell the stories it's just like just stuff from being a kid and having all mental problems and all that stuff. It's like, I couldn't have done it on the radio. I couldn't have done it anywhere else. Right. It just needed to be in a book because the thing with radio is you get one shot at it, you tell it. And if I miss a detail, then it's like, Oh man, I missed a detail or I, or I got off target or I got distracted or I went in having a headache that day or anything sure. could, could knock me off course with a thing that was very important to me to get right. So it's like, I needed to craft my version of that stuff. And that's why writing it in a book was really the only way to go. Yeah. You get into so much. I mean, there are a lot of really in, I, I've alluded a lot to the sort of the intense stuff, but you also write just as sort of incisively or like, uh, you get just as deep into sort of 
these kind of funny moments that that also are in their own way sort of mortifying. Uh, the 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 guy who edits transmissions, Andrew Horton, he and I were talking about it, and and he's he's got his copy of the book too, and tore through it, and and he mentioned <laughs> specifically, obviously the Patty Smith story, where mm-hmm. you, you asked Patty Smith if she had ever seen Humble Pie. Uh, and and she kind of is taken aback, uns, uncertain how to react. You're in an elevator together, and, and he he pointed out this beautiful thing. He's like, I love the way Tom wrote about that specific thing that happens in an interaction with somebody who you respect or who you look up to or who you admire or whatever, and all of a sudden something is coming out of your mouth that you just don't feel like has anything to do with you or what you would like to have happen and and he told me he called into the best show once and he used the phrase wham bam thank you ma'am on the best mm-hmm. show and he's like i've sure. literally I've, I've never said wham bam yeah. thank you ma'am i don't know why i did that and I, and to me that's just such a this thing that our brains sometimes do where it almost uh-huh. feels like we're we're hijacked by this like malevolent or not malevolent but just in bizarre you know th- to me your ability to write about that stuff and to write about it with the same kind of like, I don't know, detail and charm that you write about this other stuff. I don't. It was just that's a really that's a pretty incredible part, oh, you know, well, of this thank book. Thank you. That was um, first of all, I'm sure I'm sure. Uh, what was his name again? Who Andrew. Andrew. I'm sure when Andrew said "wham bam, thank you, ma'am," I'm sure I just loved that, and it went so well for him <laughs> when he said that on the best show. He, I didn't yeah, give exactly. him a hard time at all. I'm sure. Mm-mm. <laughs> um, no, but that's the whole beauty of the thing is just like when these things happen, it's like, what are you going to do with it? It's yeah. like, sometimes they, they happen and it's like, I mean, cause after that Patty Smith thing and for people who don't know, it's just basically, I was staying at a hotel during a San Francisco sketch fest and Patty Smith was staying in the hotel, same hotel. So kept running into her over and over and I finally the fourth time I saw her like screw it I'm going to say hi she got in an elevator I jumped in uh same elevator and then tried to come up with something that she had never heard before because I was going to be the person that blew her out of the water with something yeah (laughs) fresh and not just like so what was it like when television play like I'm not going to ask her about were television good? Like, it's like, I'm not going to ask her anything like that. Um, but so I asked her about the band humble pie based on a conversation I had had with a cab driver, uh, 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 a year earlier that humble, that, that humble pie were the greatest live band he had ever seen. And so I asked Patty Smith, you ever see humble pie back in the day? And back in the days, a phrase I never used, now I'm using back in the day. And the first time I decided to unwrap that one is with Patty Smith. And then, um, yeah. And then she looked immediately terrified and I'm pretty sure she got off on a floor that was not her floor and, uh, probably would have seen her in the, the fire escape stairwell. Yeah. Making her way up Hiding the stairs out. to her floor. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was one of those things after that happened, I just remember telling John Worcester about it, who was at the hotel and he was just like, Oh my God. And it was like, as if like, yeah, you, you got to take that one to the grave. Right. And it's like, mm, I think I'm gonna talk about it on the air. I think, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's too yeah. good to pass up. Uh, you know, even at the end of the book, which I'm not going to, it's, it takes too much context to explain, but there was a thing where I finally connected with a doctor that I had never, I'd lost touch with about all stuff with my personal yeah. medical mental history. And it did not go well at all. I was just so crushed. I immediately sunk onto the couch, um, for days. But even as that happened, I knew it was like, I had two thoughts in my head at the same time. One was, that's the worst thing that could have happened to me with, with this thing. Second thing was, well, now I know the book ends. 
<laughs> and it was like at the same moment I was like yeah I was like you got to be kidding me that I'm still able to detach from this enough to figure out ways that that is the way oh. the, to wrap this book up it's like oh I yeah. hate myself I kind of hate myself for that like that's but I'm also happy I'm proud of myself for it too it's that's the conundrum right there where it's just like you saw the silver lining in this thing and I kind of hate that I saw the silver lining in this thing and yeah it's it's just a funny trait where like there's times when it's just like I'm used to now through my life you get knocked down and then no, I'm not quoting Chumbawamba where it's just like then you get back up again and sometimes sometimes I hate I hate it Right. Because it just means you always get back up. It just means just, it's like, can I sit some of these out at some point? Can I stay down once in a while? And I, whatever thing is in me, it makes me always just be like, no, get back up. You get back up. You don't, you don't quit. And it's just like, can I quit once in a while? It would be nice to try quitting on for size yeah. a little bit, but. <laughs> Right, no. right. But um, but ultimately, I would much rather have that instinct in me than the instinct that never let me get back up. I'll take right. that every time. I'll take the one I'm, what I've got, even though it has its, uh, its disadvantages now and again. I don't think it's just because I read your book, but I did hear that Chumbawamba song uh, a couple days ago on the radio. Like I had forgotten the aux cord in my car or whatever, and so I was just listening to FM radio, and I heard that song, and I've heard that song however many times, ten thousand times or whatever, mm-hmm. and th- and this time while I was driving, I was like, yeah, I get it, I understand this song implicitly. I know, I know, I know this one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. in a, in a oh, weird I'm, way, yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy. Like, yeah. It's Weird, crazy right? that you that you can have that happen, you know, uh, mm-hmm. with like with songs or or with movies or with whatever, where just like one day all of a sudden it hits you like, oh no, this is a, uh, I like this or, or 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 whatever, you know, or I get it or I understand it, you know. There's this thing where you, I've always loved hearing you talk about Lou Reed on the best show, um, and I love the the CSNY. Uh, podcast that you and some of the best show dudes do about Crosby, Stills, Nash, and, and Young. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm sure you love it too, especially now that you guys are covering the the very end of that run. Oh. You know, <laughs> it's so miserable. Now we're we're doing this thing where we go th- we basically go chronologically through the collective discographies. Of Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, either together or apart or in whatever combination. And we're listening to everything. Yeah. But now now we're at the point, and I knew this day was coming, it's like, there's a point where the Neil Young albums are not good. And it's just like, that was the (laughs) one thing that was keeping me going was just like, well, at least there's a pretty good Neil Young album in this batch. And then you start getting in these runs where you're like, yeah, this is this is some pretty thin soup here to have to, like, yeah. we're, we're coming up on Americana is coming up soon, which to me oh is, that might be his worst album. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so now not you don't even you can't even rely on the Neil albums. There are a few in 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 maybe the era that you're at that I can. Are you well? Okay, I don't want to. Yeah, spoil like psychedelic the show. pill. I like psychedelic pill. Americana for some reason, it's like what is it like yeah. a 25 minute of Oh Susanna on there or something? Right. <laughs> and you're just like right. you're like yeah. when when Crazy Horse stopped being fun, that's when it's yeah you're it's in tr- just you're bad news. Tr- you're in trouble. Yes, exactly. You're in trouble. Well, we've only had one of the CSNY uh, family on on this podcast, and uh, you can Let me probably see if I guess, guess which one you had C on. We had C on, yeah, yeah, and uh, and I encourage people to go back. I had a good time talking to to David Crosby, but I will point out 
kindly and with like you know peace and love as Ringo Starr would say yes, that uh-huh. at the end at the at the end of the podcast d- during which he's like ripped into like all of his former bandmates repeatedly he's like now i want you to know like i've been very honest with you as if i had been prompting all of the ripping which i mm-hmm. absolutely hadn't i just was trying to talk to him about his records and stuff and then yeah. When he when he started bringing up Neil and stuff, I was like, "Well, I guess this is a green light for me to ask some general questions." Anyway, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, he's a motor that- mouth. God love him. <laughs> God love yeah. him. He's he's a guy who admits he's like he admits he's a dick. <laughs> like he's the first one to say he's a dick. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I mean, maybe isn't always the. It's like, which begs the question: <laughs> maybe try stop being a dick, and yeah, but. I always have a I always have a soft spot as much of a as much of a pain in the ass as that guy is and as whatever my relationship to his music is or isn't it's just like there's something about him that I just I I like him Yeah, me too actually. Big time. Also, you might be able to make the argument and and again, I haven't heard the so far episodes where you guys are covering this era. So you guys vi- might very well make this argument, but it actually probably is true that the Crosby records as of late have been at least as strong as some of the other stuff that's coming out uh from the other members. Yeah. Oh, look, I I do like I like that he made it through. He survived and Yeah. yeah. It was just the it's a, he was a casualty just waiting to happen and yeah he yeah. came out the other side of it and got this creative burst and I'd like any time an old any kind of old person older old whatever you want to say when they yeah. catch fire and they get another wind and they get a, a burst of inspiration even if it's not for me I think it's great it's very life affirming and his voice is still really strong, which is yeah. it should not be. It's like he, he still has this beautiful voice, yeah, and it's just really shocking, and it's amazing, and I'm I'm glad he's alive. I just there's so many things where some people like the idea that there's people on the planet that would have been just like, yeah, you know, would have been easier if Dylan just died on that motorcycle. Would have been a, been a better. <laughs> it would have been a better story. It's like you realize that's a human, right? Like yeah, it's a, yeah. No we're, kidding. We're talking about a human being here. That right. And he yeah. made it to eighty. Like he had a lot of living to still do, as proven by the fact that he's currently eighty. Right. And right. Maybe put out one of the better albums that a. 79 year old whatever has ever put out right Rough and rowdy ways yeah. yeah i mean i think it's a i think it's a classic like i think it's a it's up there it's like bowie it's like bowie who went out on uh an insanely like even if black star's not you know your favorite album it's like it's hard to deny that he's like clearly he's go he's doing something he's like never done you know on on that record and that's actually we've wandered far away i was actually going to start off by asking about lou reed you know before i mm-hmm. went down the cross sure that's sure. like hey no, so please. so you're a big lou reed fan let's talk about david crosby yeah. for 10 minutes you know is the perfect segue yeah <laughs> yeah it's a, it a perfect segue but mm-hmm. you you know lou who i i i i don't know i guess his his final record is lulu and before that a new age album, the Hudson uh, River Wind Meditations or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I even if you hate both of those records, and I know people who certainly hate Lulu for sure. You know, it's like clear that the guy towards the end was just as like in the zone and just as like committed to doing what he he does. Uh, and to me, that is I just, I can't think of anything more inspiring than that. Yeah, absolutely. And look, Lulu, I. There's a, a serious regret of mine is I gave in to whatever dog piling was going on with Lulu based on first impressions and the Metallica part of it is obviously unavoidable. I don't like Metallica. That's a huge turn off to me. And those guys in Metallica are a turn off. It just aesthetic. There's. There's almost nothing about Metallica that does it for me. 
But that said, if you go back to Lulu, it's like, it's an, it's a work of a guy who is singing about the inevitability of his own death. And yeah, it's a record about just being close to death. And that's about blood and pain and so much of the stuff running through that record is it's such a visceral deep record that he kind of needed these, these lunk heads to help him pull <laughs> it off. And I get, I get it, but it's like, they were lucky to be working with him and he made this thing that is just, it's, it's, an, it's, he went out on an incredibly high, high point and I missed it completely when it came out because the easy thing was to goof on it. I, I completely got that one wrong and, um, I'm glad that I have been proven wrong because Lou went out like a champ and went out like the artist that he always was with a crowning final statement that is just ugly and yeah. and uneasy and not easy to listen to because that's what this is. He's he's dying or he's close. Yeah. Or what it's just a huge statement and uh I am just I'm so glad that one of my heroes was so far ahead of me, even in the end when a guy in his early seventies is not supposed to be ahead of everybody. He was still ahead and went out the way he went out. Yeah. Yeah. You talk, I mean, I don't, I've, I've, I've wanted to not like cover too much stuff direct from the book in a way that that robs the book of you know because everybody who's listening sh- should should buy the book they should read it they yes. should they should hear you do this you know I, I get thank you. yeah thank you but that but that buy said the there For yeah the love buy, of buy, God, <laughs> please buy the book <laughs> buy 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 this book buy it never ends it's very mm-hmm. good it, uh, but you know there are you you discuss. Um, you discuss the connection you have with Lou Reed, and which is that mm-hmm. you both experienced electroshock therapy. Which is, mm-hmm. it, it it to read it in your book, Tom was like, uh, I I mean I, I remember reading it in the Lou Reed bio that came out a couple years ago uh, mm-hmm. that he that he had gone through it, and and even then sort of being like, wow, that was such a different time, you know. And then to Those read it were in your different book. times. He said it. Those were different times. <laughs> but then, to then to read it, me. to read it in your book too, it was just like, oh my god, like yeah, it, this is just this this thing that obviously it was considered an acceptable, mm-hmm. if not you know a clearly a damaging process. But I but I wondered if like, you know, do you remember when you first learned that Lou Reed had had sort of that 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 was something he had gone through? Yeah, it was a huge uh, a huge. It was just huge. It just was yeah. like, here's somebody who is the the architect of everything that means something to me in terms of music. It's just like he was the he was the guy who wrote those songs, and it was just huge. I didn't know it at the time when I was going through it, but learning later it was such a such a i mean comfort is such a the wrong word because there's nothing comforting about it but it's like it was uh it was a comfort to just know that this guy it happened to this guy also and yeah he lived the life he lived and cuz there's kind of a point where when you go through extreme stuff like that 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 is really just meant to merely keep you alive that um, anything over anything beyond that is like gravy that you got to actually do anything with your life. It's like the goal is just to not die. And um, yeah. And just seeing what he did in the aftermath of that, 
and it really mattered to me. And it always says he's, he's just like, yeah, he's just a, he's, he just represents something to me that, that kind of kept me going and symbolizes that particular kind of strength that I wanted to also have to where it's just like this stuff happened to me, but it doesn't mean it's the end of me. Yeah. And I'm not going to let it be the end of me. I, in fact, I'll find ways to channel it in whatever weird way. It took me forever to do it, but I did do it. And I could also see when, when his family members would talk about it, they all had different, they were, they were, they were still dealing with it that that happened yeah. to their kid or to their brother and it was just i felt that same impact it's just it's so huge and um so i understood it and it's something i still struggle with all the time there's a part of me that never wanted to make any of this stuff public i never wanted to be in but i knew i kind of had to if i was going to do a book about my life and tell stories in my life. I can't, I can't leave the, the, the hub of the whole thing out. Cause that's what this yeah. is. Everything is informed by that. I went through this and everything that it did to me after that. And, um, yeah, it just really, it cast a huge shadow over everything. And I wanted to, I figured there's more value in, sharing it, facing it down, sharing it, taking ownership over it and, and exerting some sort of control over it rather than continuing to just bury it and deny it. Um, yeah. And it is, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a, it was a big thing and Lou Reed will always be top of the pyramid for me, for what he means on a personal level. Um, yeah. And the estate was very kind to me in terms of helping secure the uh, reprinting lyrics in the book where they did not have to be. And I just will always be grateful for, um, for just the, just all the help I got from the estate and from Lori Anderson and Don Fleming and, um, and Jason Stern. Yeah. Just, they helped so much. And cause it, I really needed lyrics from, uh, kill your sons to be in the book. And it just, they, they were very, very considerate and I will always be grateful. Yeah. You spend a lot of time in the book. Clearly, you know, you get into your deep comedy roots and you get into, you know, working in 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 television and, and and writing stuff like that you spend so much of the book talking about music too though obviously that being such a huge part of your life and uh you have a great story about the monkeys and you have a incredible story about a a, a legacy 60s artist and a music video <laughs> that you proposed to said legacy uh, -huh. uh 60 artist and i'm not going to tell anybody anything <laughs> about it because you have to read it I will say uh -huh. that said legacy artist screwed mm. up by not doing it because it would have been um, a, a great a great choice on their part. But a couple months ago on the best show, somebody called in and started talking to you about their band, and I think you either said something about how maybe you'd want to produce a record someday or make records someday. Um, you have a great singing voice. Uh, you sing a lot on The Best Show and Double Threat. Uh, I'm just curious, like, do you want, I mean, is that is that something that you, now that you've got the book done, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't Tom think Sharpling I have comes, it. I, Tom Sharpling comes alive, no? I don't have it in me to do it. I think I'm too, the comedy part casts too wide, a sh uh, too, too, too strong yeah. a, a shadow over things for me to ever feel like I could be sincere in that regard. And I would just, I don't think I could do it. I just think the first moment I tried to sing something or whatever, I would feel like, what are you doing? 
<laughs> you're supposed to because then you think of like dane cook when he did his song and you're just like is that what i'm doing here am i slightly better than that that's not good enough you, to be slightly you better would probably than that. be You'd be better than Dane Cook, yeah. Well, what about producing uh, producing music for other artists? I would like to watch people make records. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would really like to, to kind of watch somebody make a record and um, be just like an advocate, but not a full-on producer yeah. for a thing. And kind of maybe help somebody come up with a a vision for what they could do with a record based on what they've done before. But I don't, I can't do the nuts and bolts part of it. I don't know enough about that. Yeah. Well, you could always get somebody to be the engineer and then you're just the mastermind. That's what I'm, that's what I'm envisioning. Sure. Well, I though, but the thing is with those, I'm always like, what did you really do on this? (laughs) Did you really produce the record or did you just kind of, like I always wonder, like when Rick Rubin is like, "Yeah, I produce a Johnny Cash uh, comeback stuff." It's like, "Oh wow, what what did you do with that?" It's like, "Well, I just kind of had him do stuff acoustic with uh, yeah old old songs." It's like, "Oh man, that's that's wild." It's like, "Yeah, I uh, also did a thing with uh, Neil Diamond. Really uh, <laughs> produced his comeback record. Oh my God, that's so cool. What did he do?" Well, I kind of stripped it down and had him just do. It's like, <laughs> so you're just all you're doing is throwing out the horn players on your, these things. Like, well, the, right. these guys got too bloated, <laughs> the, too much bloat set in, and you strip it down. It's like that is not nothing, but it's not everything either. Right, right. This is the second time that Rick Rubin has come up on transmissions in a semi-derogatory fashion, and so mm-hmm. I'm just gonna once again make it clear that Rick Rubin is very welcome to come on transmissions and I will show him all, all due respect. Oh, look, he's so fat. He's a fascinating <laughs> guy. I would love it if he came on the show. It would be great to hear. He's a, he's a, it's look, it's not an accident when somebody is next to so many things like that. That's right. not an accident. If somebody's next to one thing, you can write it off as any kind of L- love, any kind. Or- yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Yeah, exactly. They tripped over it. Anybody (laughs) can trip over something, but when they're next to a thing time and time again, it's like with John Cale, it's like if he was never in the Velvet Underground and he only produced stuff, it's just like, well, look at who he produced. It's like the Stooges and and the Modern Lovers and Patti Smith, right? And who else? Devo and just like he's just Squeeze, yeah. And he was just there for that's not an accident like right right and so those are always the things like and rick rubin whatever i think of him in certain ways it's undeniable that he's he has a vision and loves music a certain way i was just listening to a thing of him talking to eno last night when i was going to sleep and it was yeah he gets it he might not be my guy but he gets it i can't i can't put that down such such a that 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 was a really good interview actually i mean that was like sometimes i think about like could i ever interview brian eno and the answer is no i definitely would just be like absolutely he's the most conversational (laughs) dude going i listen to these brian eno interviews at night and the one thing that gets lost when people with brian eno is just like he just comes from a family of postal workers he's a very Right. He's a very right. unencumbered, and I don't mean simple. And as a, I mean simple as a po- most positive thing, he is not a pretentious guy. He has pretensions, but he is not. He is not pretentious in a way that is exclusionary, or like I said, or like he's not weaponizing his yeah. intellect. <laughs> He does things and he knows what this is for and who can make a connection with this and that and this could reach out to these people. He's a very practical, grounded guy. I think you would have an amazing conversation with Brian Eno. Well, I appreciate that. I will say I got a set of those oblique strategies and talking about the practicality, mm-hmm. I've been pulling I've been pulling cards, you know, when I run into problems with projects I'm working on. 
and reading them, and nine times out of ten, they are practical solutions. It's sort of packaged as this sort of pseudo chance high mind intellect thing, but it's like very often these cards are just practical solutions. So yeah, and, I think and that they're that's a, they're playful too. Like the cards are right, fun, right? And I think that gets lost in it too. Is that this guy had a sense of humor and has a sense of humor, and it's very easy to, to think he's just the ambient dude. Um, but he's, 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 I think he's a funny guy. Like in, I've seen interviews with him where he would do different voices and stuff. And I was just like, man, he's, yeah. <laughs> he is un, he is up for anything. And that's the yeah. part about him. That is a constant inspiration for me with Brian Eno is just like, he's just up for going somewhere new all the time and just seeing what that looks like. And he just he just goes where it, where he wants to go and tries things that put him out of his comfort zone. I just hope you don't draw the uh, the oblique strategy that says like delete anything you recorded after today at this. Like you're gonna be like, hey, sorry, I pulled yeah, the wrong sorry, card. Tom. I deleted the interview. Yeah, oh, okay. I had to. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't just. Brian told get, me to. Yeah, couldn't just get the card that said. Start at the end and yeah, exactly. End at the beginning or whatever, like <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well, well, Tom. Before before we before we close, I do want to ask you one more music question, and that's how excited are you for these King Crimson shows that are coming up later in the? They're coming to a casino here where I live, and I'm I'm so deeply thrilled at the prospect of getting a room in a casino resort for a mm-hmm. weekend. And and seeing King Crimson on a Saturday night, and then just like you know, wandering around a casino the rest oh, of the I'm, weekend. I am so thrilled. That's like the to me, it's kind of the reward to get to the other side of the pandemic, is that they get to tour and getting to see them with the three drummer lineup is just one of the best things I've ever seen, and I'm so excited. And I don't know if you heard the the cameo type thing that was recorded oh, yeah. for me. And the best part of that is that I reached out to uh, his camp through that through that uh, cameo type service. I'm not sure what it's called to say because he offered. He was like, he's like, Tom, I ordered your book and it's coming to England in in August, even though it comes out in the States in July. I also yeah. want you to be my guest at a show either in in New Jersey or Philadelphia. And it's like, well, I'm not. I'm in Los Angeles now. So I wrote saying like, yeah. hey, I'm in Los Angeles. Would it at all be possible to go to the L.A. show? And then he literally emailed me back directly and said, absolutely, you're on the list for the Los Angeles show on his personal list and that just like I'm so not susceptible to so much of that stuff but for some reason that guy well that was a bullseye right in my gut and I was just moved that this this person he's another one of those people he's a beacon of integrity to me and he has always been on the the right side of things in terms of the art of it, even in the face of being commercial, he's known when you do a little bit of this, you do a little bit of that to keep things going. Sometimes the thing's big, then you make the thing small, just he, a hero. Um, so to have that guy be like, you're on my list. I got, it. I was like, <laughs> yeah, got it. yeah. It pressed my buttons. So, Oh, I'm thrilled. I cannot wait. And you're going to have a great time and I'm going to have a great time. It's uh it's going to be really cool and yeah, a nice end to the pandemic. So, well, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sort of in it. Yes. I'm going to see I'm going to see Fast 9 later this afternoon. So I'm going to I'm going to consider that the the end of the pandemic. It's my first movie in a movie theater since First Cow. And I like to think that that's an interesting uh no. The last movie I saw before the pandemic, First Cow, beautiful, remarkable work of art, and now I'm yeah. heading back to see Fast 9, mostly yep. as an excuse to eat popcorn. You know, I'm I'm really pumped, so. Well, enjoy yourself from first to fast. Look at you. <laughs> from You're first donut. to fast. 
uh, Tom, this book is great, and it's been a real honor getting a chance to chat with you about it and uh, and reading it. I've, I've really enjoyed this, and um, the show is a, is a great inspiration. This book's an inspiration. Uh, big fan of what you're doing with Double Threat, and uh, and I can't wait for Grown Ups Three uh, when that happens. Oh, I saw you, something. You, you learn I saw something wait. on. <laughs> I saw something online that referred to you that said you were like that like almost referred to it as if that were a real thing that had been made like oh, i Tom saw Sharpley, that too when i was no, like known for known for grown-ups three and i was just like yeah i, I guess <laughs> i guess i don't know i saw that too and i was just like i don't think they know that it's not a movie right <laughs> but whatever. it is in my heart <laughs> it is in my heart too jason well, no, this was a this was a serious thrill, and I'm such a fan of everything you all do over there, and uh, so it's exciting to cross paths and get to do this with with you. And I appreciate all of it. This was fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Tom. We'll talk again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for listening. I'm Jason Woodbury. I write, host, and produce transmissions. Andrew Horton edits our audio. Graphics by Sarah Goldstein. Jonathan Mark Walls builds a visualizer version of this show. Executive producer and announcer is Justin Gage. Tune in to his weekly show on Sirius XMU every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. California time. No static at all. And if you enjoyed my conversation with Tom, uh, you should tune into The Best Show. It airs live on the internet every Tuesday night, and then it's available as a podcast the next day. You can check it out at bestshow.net. It's really hilarious, and it features great interviews occasionally. Uh, I especially like when Tom talks with musicians. His Kim Gordon conversation is a real winner, as is one he did. Uh, I, I always say a few years back, but it was... Maybe more than a few years back. Anyway, he did a great one with Yola Tang, but you can check it out in the Best Show archives. Numero Group released a great 16-disc box set, the best of the Best Show. It's out of print, but worth it if you can track it down. Uh, my buddies at Flannel Graph Records have a much more attainable introduction. As well, you can check out the vinyl edition of Rock, Rot, and Rule. That's a Sharpling and Worcester classic. Their, their first, really. Uh, and that's available over on Bandcamp to stream or uh, pick up a copy of the record. If you're into it, rating and reviewing transmissions wherever you listen would be great. It helps new people find the show, and we dig that. You can find Aquarium Drunkard on Patreon if you want to support us even more. We'll be back very soon. Uh, tune in Friday for a bonus, our July bonus episode of Transmissions with Ripley Johnson of Rose City Band, Moon Duo, and Wooden Ships. Okay, thanks for listening. Keep cool until we speak again. <laughs>